Okay. And that just tests his flexibility, so you're kind of screening in the back too, because you're not quite sure yet what's going on. And then we'll have him do the squat. Now squat is a good test. No, on a, like, like he is. So it goes, it goes back to what uh, Dr. Benjamin Joseph was saying, is there some asymmetry in his squat? And you have to get into it, and to get in a full squat, you need 140 degrees of flexion of the hips. You need 150 or more degrees of flexion of the knees. You need ankle dorsiflexion of at least 10 degrees to get in a full squat. He does it pretty well. I mean, he's a little asymmetric on, on the two sides, uh, but not too bad. He's not quite on his toes. He's kind of foot flat. But it's a wonderful, gross, quick exam, range of motion. If you have a knee effusion, you can't get down there. If you're having some foot pain, you can't get down there, and so on and so forth. So he does that really, really well. So it's like a sed rate. It's a quick sed rate of what's going on in his range of motion. Now you have him get back up. Up. <laughs> now he used his hands. So he pushed off. That means he's got a positive gower, so therefore he's got Duchenne muscular dystrophy, right? <laughs> Try it again. So you have to have him repeat it. And sometimes you have to have him fold his arms. No, nope. you have him fold his arms like this. And do it again. All the way down. All the way down. You're going to do it with him. Well, maybe like this. Maybe sometimes you have to get him on his knees and no hands. Get back up. Okay? Now get up. No hands. Ah. <laughs> so you have to repeat it. Because kids will often push off your knees just like you'll push off your knees. Like, oh, I'm old, I've got to push off. Or if you're real fat, you have to push off. Okay? So you, you've, you've done a rough screening not only on his range of motion, but also his motor function to a degree. And then you can pick him up to see if he's got a Marian sign. And he doesn't. He's nice and strong. He gets up there on your table. And then you can look at some of the findings there. But the best test for hip pathology, we're zeroing on the hip. Can you lay on his stomach? Stomach. Prone. Is prone internal rotation. You saw it in the sitting position. But this is even better because it tightens up the hip capsule and it'll show pathology. This, this is the, the ultimate test for, for hip pathology. It'll find just about everything that's wrong with the hip in, a, in adult or kids, except probably DDH isn't the greatest on DDH, but it works well for synovitis, arthritis, Perthes disease. It doesn't tell you what it's got, but it tells you it's in a hip because it's going to show you a little, ooh, he flinches when you do it a little bit too. It'll, you'll, you'll see a difference and then the right side he only goes out, oh, 15, 10, 15 degrees the left he'll go out, not a great amount. He only goes out about 30 degrees or so. But it's, it, when you tighten up the capsule in the prone position, and you always need to do this. I don't tell you, I can't tell you how many my residents come in and said he, he goes, he has a coker criteria. He can't walk. And it's got a temperature. And I said, well, what was his exam? Well, he can't walk. Well, you can do this test. Coker's here, so you, you can <laughs> progress him. You need the exam. You need the exam. And this test is the best. Best test. It's most sensitive, because you'll find it. Now, on a two-year-old, he won't get in this position, because he knows what's bad happens when you get in this position. Shots. So you won't find a two-year-old that want to get in this position. So what do you do when you have a, a small child that can't get into the prone position? Well, you get the father here. Maybe not the father. Can you hold him? Become the father. <laughs> <laughs> and you turn him. You turn him like this and hold him up tight. Can you put your, just put your arm around his uh, butt there? Yeah. And you can still do the test because the child will cling to their mother or their father. You now are in a prone position. You can still do the test. Okay. It's a simple little way, and they they they're much more happy to let be held by their parent than to get on the table. So now you can still do that very sensitive test. So prone internal rotation. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Always do it. You don't want your staff doctors to say, well, he had the cro Coker criteria. He couldn't walk, and he's got a temperature. Therefore, he's got a septic hip. Ah, come on. Examine the patient. So you do the external and internal rotation we did. Then you get him on the supine position. You go through the routine exams that you've seen before by many of the speakers. You're going to do your Thomas test. You're going to flex up the hip. 
and you can see a little bit of a flexion contracture there on the right. And this one comes down just a little easier. So there might be a little tightness here, but this is a tough little test. You're going to look at abduction of the hip that we talked about before and let the hip, you got to get him relaxed. He definitely guards on the right hip. So it's pretty clear with the internal rotation prone and the abduction that he doesn't like abducting the right hip. Uh, it goes out on the left, perhaps 60, where this one's 20, 25 degrees. It's very, very tight on the right side in flexion. We can maybe, I don't know, we can just turn a little bit, guy. You can see the audience can see the difference. Very subtle changes, but not on, not on hip abduction. It's very clear. You can do it in extension, and again, it'll magnify because you pick up your gracilis, and you can see the asymmetry, one's 20, one's 40. Um, what else have we, we done? We've done abduction. You can do adduction. It's going to be important uh, sometimes for SI joint type problems of the hip. Straight leg raising is important for cerebral palsy patients. For sciatica, you want to do that if somebody's uh, back because you certainly want to work up the back if it isn't in the hip. And he does straight leg raising pretty symmetrically, about 70 degrees or so. He's definitely externally rotated, so he doesn't want to ro internally rotate either hip very much. Even the other side is, is uh, you're a little worrisome on the asymmetry for this little guy. Um, anything, well, let's do the prone um, uh, hip extension uh, tests and bring him down the end and show him the Staley type of test if we can. I don't know how stable this table is, so. So we'll bring him way down to the end. And then somebody will have uh, the mom here. We had the father work. Uh, it, it hold the, the trunk down so you can see. Now we're going to do the right hip. This is actually easier to see the flexion contracture if you hold the pelvis because you can, you can stabilize the, and you can see right around here, he kind of blocks and then he moves the whole pelvis up. So around 15, 20 degrees, he has a little flexion contracture on the right side. Whereas on the left, he comes up almost to neutral. So it's a little, it's a nice one that's helpful of a test for cerebral palsy especially, but it even helps you on a little bit of synovitis of the hip like this guy has. Anything else you want to show him or? Pardon? Telescoping measurements. Measurements. Uh, I mean measuring the length? Yeah. Okay. Point oh, on Galeazzi and things like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so leg lengths uh, we're talking about, we, we watched him standing up. And, and sometimes that's difficult in the prone position to, that he's in right now. You can do this, which is upside down Galeazzi test, if you will. If you have somebody with a leg length discrepancy, you can, you can see that there's no difference in the tibia length. And so we have somebody with a difference in length. You want to find out which segment is short. Is it femoral short, shortening or is it tibial shortening? In his case, he's equal here. Okay, we'll turn him over. And then the, the true um, Galeazzi test in the uh, supine position to again look at the the differences in height, and they look pretty symmetric. And then you look at uh, size. This, this lad has atrophy of his uh, right thigh. That's pretty obvious, uh, of a, maybe a, not quite a sonar, but there's a little bit there. And you do your motor testing and the other things that I think if you're, you're accurate in doing it, you check his back to be sure he doesn't have any tenderness in his back, that there's some cause like a discitis that's causing him to limp, and uh, the foot and so on. Now what if the child, the parents come in and he said he doesn't walk? can't walk, so he can't even do any of all this tests. You can do your range of motion and so on, and that'll help screen it, but sometimes the motion and everything is good, but the child won't walk. The second, next question to ask, can he crawl? Can he crawl? And how does that help him? If he can crawl but he can't walk? Anybody? Yeah, but this is, the weak abductors doesn't, uh, no, nah, he could probably do, he could probably do that. Think pathology. Where is the pathology? Spinal muscles. Where is the pathology? Weak spinal muscles. Pardon? Weak spinal muscles. Could Maybe. be spinal muscles, but, it's, but you're thinking of the lower extremity now. You have a child that can't walk, but he can crawl. Here, let's see this guy crawl across the floor. Okay? Can he, can he get on four knees and crawl? Crawl, yeah. So he's a nice reciprocal crawl. He does that pretty well. So he's not too painful from his hip in this case. What if he had a broken tibia? 
The most common kid thing in kids is a little toddler's fracture. Would he be able to do that? Yes, he would. But would he be able to walk? No. Does that help you? You've now shortened your exam down to something from the knees down, haven't you? It shortens your x-rays. Motion of the hip is fine. We now know it's tibia or foot. It makes my x-ray simpler. A lot simpler. I call it the crawl test. Always do your crawl test because people forget he can't walk. Well, can he crawl? Two-year-olds especially help you. You put them on the floor and they shoot across the floor. And so now you know that it's not a septic hip you're dealing with, but it might be a fracture in the foot. It might be a needle in the foot. It might be a little spiral fracture of the tibia. It helps you out. Now, if you can't crawl either, now the, the ball game's open to the hip and other things, maybe even in the spine that you mentioned. So it's a very valuable thing to add into your gait analysis. Can they do the crawl test, if you will? Oh, let's see. I think I've lost everything, and I hope that's enough. Sure. Okay, we're going to do, actually going to look at X-rays now. Big round of applause for Deep. Super patient. He wins the award. Any questions, anyone? Mostly for exam. So if you've got questions on the exam, put it all in. Observation first. Have him do his gait. Then you touch them and you do your range of motion. Slight difference in the film, some of the earlier ones. Yeah. <laughs> when was, was that the same patient? Same patient, isn't it? Go back to the earlier ones. When were those taken? <coughs> oh, the only one he had. Okay. We better, we better get a classification expert up here to <laughs> tell us what this is. So he's got some sclerosis. It's nice. Obviously, you always want the other side, so you have comparison. Be sure he doesn't have early signs of it, because you don't know it's perfect. So, you know, he's got some changes, but you want to be sure of the other side, because he's got quite asymmetric abduction or uh, external rotation preference on that side compared to the other side, too, or compared to normal. Uh, but he certainly has a sclerosis, a little bit of fragmentation, and, uh, and that's about all we have. We have a lateral. It's very, very uh, collapsed on the lateral, as you can see, in total head involvement. So you got a, a tough uh, prognosis in this little guy. And do we know his bone age? He's six, chronologically, you say? Scott, we don't use bone age here at all because we don't have atlases for uh, our population. Uh, so we rely on chronological age, really. Okay. Uh, absolutely. In fact, I, I was going to ask the audience how many of them would consider surgery, and I wanted to, ba to bait them and uh, to see whether they'd, s they'd consider surgery before the range of movement increases. So I, I, I'm just an examiner. You'll have to handle that. No, so yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I think the first thing is to get the range of movement back. The, how old is the boy in chronologic? Sorry? Six. Six years old. And the AP view doesn't show too much of extrusion, interestingly. But, uh, so if you can restore the range of movement, I tend to keep them off their feet for a period of time. Monitor them on a four-monthly interval, and if they show that it starts extruding, then consider containment. Consider containment. Yeah, we, would, we would do the same to begin with of such a young guy. And he looks younger than six. He looks, yeah, it's a small six. Well, that's that's subtle. It's usually not, yeah. But he's got a, you know, he's got a lot of head involvement, and we, we, I frequently use uh, petri casts and yes. adductor yeah. lengthening. So I might schedule that about three months from now. These things aren't improving on a yeah. rest period. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't rush into surgery, <laughs> surgery on this one. Yeah. Okay. We're doing well. Thank you very much. Scott Mubarak for that instead of the two minute exam I'm gonna rechristen that to a Scott Super exam. Mm. Thank you, that's lovely. That is lovely. Thank you. After the interactive section, I think I'm going to invite uh, Abhay. 
uh, for observational gait analysis. Abhay Kote is from Melbourne. He's an expert on gait analysis, but we pinned him down to talk on observational gait analysis and not instrumented gait analysis. Thanks uh, for inviting me to talk about this. I agree totally that it has to be very curtailed because uh, there are lots of things that we can talk about and uh, I'll just restrict myself to giving you guys a little scheme of what you can kind of keep in your heads and so that you cover things without missing out any points. So uh, to start with, uh, if somebody asks you, well, what's gait? You can just say it's a person's manner of walking and you know that uh, different people walk very differently and it's quite all right uh, to do that as long as you can appreciate that as being normal. Now the trouble arises when it's not normal and we need to be clinically astute to pick that up when they walk into the clinic room to say, is this person walking normally or not? So if you think of that, think of it in this way to start with, that if you see them move from one place to the other across the room, remember that the hip, knee and foot are powering this. So that's